Hello, I'm Professor Brian Boucher. Welcome back. We're going to end our week-long look at cash flows with a look at the 3M annual report. We'll take a look at their statement of cash flows, their supplemental disclosure about cash flows in the footnotes, and the section of the management discussion analysis, or MDNA, where they talk about their cash flows during the year. Hope you enjoy the video. 3M statement of cash flows is on page 51 of their annual report. First thing I like to look at is this breakdown of operating, investing, and financing activities to see what kind of stage or life cycle the company is in. So 3M throws off about $5 billion of cash from operations every year. It's pretty steady. They have cash outflows from investing activities of about $2.6 billion every year. And they also have net financing cash outflows of about $2 billion, other than a blip in 2011. So this is sort of the classic mature company profile. You've got products that are essentially cash cows. They're just throwing off cash, things like post-it notes and scotch tape, things that we can't do it, do without. They're still re reinvesting a moderate amount back into the company, back into long-term assets, and we'll look at this more in a second. And they are net cash outflows for financing. So they don't have to borrow, they don't have to raise money to fund their operations or their investments anymore. Instead, their operations are able to fund all of their investing activities and still throw off some cash that they can use to um, pay off debt or repurchase equity or pay dividends. So just to, to get some more insight into this, one thing that's often good to look at is comparing depreciation to purchase as a property, plant, and equipment. Again, it's very rough, but if you view depreciation as using up your fixed assets, capital expenditures obviously is acquiring new ones, it looks like 3M's at about replacement level. Uh, so they are investing a lot in new PP&E, but it's sort of replacing the things that they're using up. They do have, though, some active acquisitions, so about a billion or so in 2012. And then there's a lot of activity with marketable securities. So they bought about 5.4 billion of 5.5 billion of marketable securities, but then they sold or had those almost all mature within 2012. So I, I think what happens is 3M is throwing off a lot of cash. If they don't immediately have an acquisition in mind or immediately have uh, purchase of property, plant, equipment, they plow it into marketable securities and investments. And then when those opportunities to make an acquisition or buy pp and &E come, they liquidate the marketable securities and use that to um, go out and make their acquisition. So it's almost like they're, they're serving as their own bank by buying these marketable securities, holding their cash, getting some return, waiting until they can invest it. And then in the financing section, we see a lot of the financing cash outflow is purchase of treasury stock. That's probably for stock options. And then there's a big dividend that they pay to shareholders, uh, which again is another example oftentimes of a mature company that if you don't have a full set of investments that you can plow your cash back into, you may as well just pay it back to your shareholders and let them reinvest it somewhere. So I think you're ready to do this kind of life cycle growth analysis on your own. What I would suggest is when you're done with this video, go online to a couple companies' websites, Go to their financial statements, take a look at their statement of cash flows, and see if you can draw these kind of conclusions based on what's in operating, investing, and financing. Now let's dig into the operating section a bit more. So we start with net income. Uh, ignore the non-controlling interest stuff for now and just view it as net income. Nice steady growth in net income indicating that they are consistently able to price their products enough to cover the cost of running the business. And, you know, typical of a mature company, you have this steady profitability. That steady profitability turns into steady cash flows. So very mature, well-performing, humming along nicely company. One of the big discrepancies between net income and net cash from operations is depreciation and amortization. Now, remember, that's not a source of cash, even though it looks like it here. Remember, depreciation reduces net income. It's non-cash, so we have to add it back to get from cash to get to cash from operations. Fairly 
big number for the 3M because it does a lot of manufacturing and manufacturing companies tend to have high depreciation and amortization. Then we have a number of other non-cash expenses. So things like pension, stock-based compensation, um, and we have some excess so have deferred taxes and excess tax benefits. So first the pension and post-retirement contribution, stock-based compensation. These are things we recognize as expenses now, which means they're part of net income. But the cash is either paid in the future, as is the case for pensions and post-retirement benefits, or the cash really isn't paid as it is for stock-based compensation, although part of it is you're buying back treasury stock to use to satisfy options. But in any case, there's no cash flow this period for these expenses. And we'll talk more about the stock-based compensation later on. The pensions and post-retirements, that's beyond the scope of this course. Uh, you'll have to come and, and take my course at Wharton, my elective, to see more on pensions and post-retirements. The deferred taxes we'll obviously get to later in the class. So then we get to the section on changes in assets and liabilities. These are the changes in working capital. And what we see is the big chunk here are accounts receivable and inventory are negative. So let's think about what that means. Negative number on the operating cash flow under the indirect method means that these amounts must be going up on the balance sheet. Accounts receivable goes up as a non-cash asset. To stay in balance, we have to subtract it on the cash flow statement. And yes, even though you can't see it, I am doing up and down arrows with my hand. Inventories go up on the balance sheet. Non-cash asset going up, we have to subtract that on the cash flow statement. Accounts payable is also going up. Now remember, that's a liability. So if accounts payable, a liability increases. It's on the other side of the balance sheet equation. We have to increase it on the cash flow statement. So these could equal, these could could represent either good or bad news. Um, bad news scenario would be our customers are not paying us, we're having trouble selling our inventory, we're having to stretch our payables. But that's probably not the case here given the nice growth and profitability that's going on. And so a more likely story is it's, a, it's still a growing company. So during the year, we're making a lot of credit sales at the end of the period, we're building inventories in anticipation of future sales, we uh, are getting more raw materials at the end of the year in, in anticipation of production. And so based on other things I've seen, it probably is a good news scenario that this is representing growth in working capital rather than bad news where you, you can't collect receivables and you can't get rid of your inventories. So overall, from the face of the statement, it looks like a mature company that still has some growth potential. Now we're going to look at some other sections to try to get some additional information about what's going on with cash flows. And yes, for these cash flow statements that you're going to look up on the web, you also should be able to do this analysis of the operating section. Look at net income, cash from operations, all the big differences between the two. And in a couple weeks we're going to do ratio analysis, which will give you a few more tools to try to understand these changes in working capital accounts, like accounts receivable, inventory, and payables. Now I've jumped ahead to page 69, where we have footnote 6, which is supplemental cash flow information. So if you remember back to the first video of the week, I said that there has to be a disclosure of cash taxes paid and cash interest payments. And as we talked about in, I think, the second to last video, that disclosure is there. So if people want to remove cash interest and cash taxes from operating cash flow, they have the number. So in this footnote, we see the cash taxes and the cash interest. So if you want to start with the cash from operations and the cash flow statement in terms of you know doing some kind of valuation to measure operating cash flow, but you don't want tax or interest in there, you can pull those numbers out using this disclosure. I also said, I think in the first video, that there has to be disclosures of any non-cash transactions, which affect the balance sheet amounts, but then obviously don't show up on the cash flow statement. So 3M does have an example of one here. They were buying shares of held by its non-controlling interest, Sumitomo. And again, we're not going to we'll worry about non-controlling interest in these acquisition or these uh, subsidiaries later on. But basically, to buy Sumitomo 3M shares from Sumitomo Electric Industries, they paid 
3M paid some cash, but they also gave them a notes payable in exchange for shares. So that would be a non-cash transaction that increases notes payable, um, increases the, um, sorry, reduces the non-controlling interest, which, which we'll talk about later, but, but doesn't really affect the cash flow because this is a non-cash component. Wow, I really muffed up that transaction. Forget the non-controlling interest part. What happened was 3M bought shares in Sumitomo 3M. They debited investment in Sumitomo, an asset to increase it. They credited cash because they bought some with cash, and they credited notes payable. The part that's the notes payable is the non-cash acquisition of the shares in Sumitomo, and that's what's disclosed here. One last section to look at related to cash flows is in the management discussion and analysis, which is on page 36. Remember, this is the, the MDNA is the section where 3M management is supposed to provide their own narrative to explain what happened during the year. So it'll give us more insight into some of the numbers that we saw in the cash flow statement. They repeat their operating section and talk about what happened in terms of their cash flows during the year. The big year for the big reason for the year-on-year -year increase in cash flows is net income went up. Um, they do note that accounts receivable inventories and payables increased by 312 compared to increases of 484 last year, but they really don't talk much about what happened with that. Then at the bottom of the page, they disclose free cash flow. And as I said a couple videos ago, this is a voluntary disclosure. Notice it's labeled as a non-GAAP measure. That means that there's no requirement by the SEC or the FASB to provide this measure, which also means there's no standardization. Companies can define this measure however they want, and, and when they do that, they have to alert investors and analysts that this is a non-GAAP measure, so it's not standardized. So remember, free cash flow is supposed to be operating cash flow minus um, investment in the future. So we've got net cash from operations um, from the cash flow statement as 3M's operating cash flow. And then they use purchase of PP&E as their measure of investment in the future, investing in new property plant equipment, which gives them a pretty high free cash flow. And there's actually a pretty good definition. I've seen a lot worse. Um, so there's a pretty good definition of free cash flow. But again, before you would use this number, you want to make sure you know what's in the definition and that you're comfortable with it. On the next page, we have cash from investing activities. And what they've done here is they've netted all the marketable securities action into a small number. So instead of showing on the face the $5 billion they bought and then the almost $5 billion they sold, they just show a net number. So it really highlights that the big drivers of cash outflows were purchase of pp and &E and acquisitions. And they tell you the pp and &E is expanding manufacturing capacity in key growth markets, especially international like China, Turkey, and Poland. And so we can see that they are, they do still have growth opportunities, and a lot of those growth opportunities see, seem to be international. Uh, for acquisitions, they refer us to note two. Um, you can go there and look. I'm, I'm probably not going to jump ahead and look at that. And then finally, they talk about cash flows from financing activities. So remember, the big chunks here were proceeds from, uh, I'm sorry, purchases of treasury stock. And the treasury stock, they say, is for stock-based compensation. Now, we'll talk about this later in the course, but basically, stock-based compensation is where you award your employees either stock options or stock grants. You could either issue new stock to satisfy that, or what most companies do is they just buy back their own stock and then either sell it to employees or give it to employees under these stock-based um, ownership plan or compensation plans. And then the other big chunk here is dividends to, to stockholders. Uh, 3M has paid dividends since 1916. So we're almost on 100 years of dividends. And, and that's, again, just consistent with uh, companies that are very, very mature products, uh, throwing off a lot of cash. One thing they tend to do is they start paying dividends. 3M started pretty early. Uh, I'm not sure it was post-it notes in 1916. And the thing about dividends is they tend to be sticky. Once you start paying them, you always want to start paying. You always want to keep paying them. If you ever cut them, it would be viewed by the market as bad news. So that's where we find all of the cash flow information in the annual report. 
And that's going to wrap it up for our week on cash flow statements. Hey, I was going to say that. Well, well, anyway, this does wrap up our week long look at cash flows. It also wraps up our three week look at the fundamentals, the real basics, the building blocks that we're going to use the rest of the course. Now we're going to do the rest of the course is take a stroll around the balance sheet and look at various asset liability stockholders equity accounts along with their related revenues and expenses to talk about advanced topics or things that you'd want to look at in all of those different areas of the financials. We're going to start next week with accounts receivable and inventory. I'll see you then.